Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Emilia Jarochowska and I am joining you today from Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the third Sets of Line Great Debate. And following the success of the pre previous two debates, we continue with this interactive format. Uh, today's motion will be autogenic processes in sedimentary systems are just part of the allogenic spectrum. Uh, I hope this is provocative and I would like to introduce uh, our speakers today. Uh, speaking for the motion will be Andres Strasser from the University of Fribourg and David de Plesshauer, <laughs> oh, I butchered it probably, I'm sorry, uh, speaking from the University of uh, Bremen, but also uh, on this occasion uh, making an official announcement uh, about his uh, upcoming move to the University of Münster next year. And uh, the opposing team will be Sam Perkis, uh, joining from the University of Miami, and Anthony Shilito from the University of Oxford. And before we start, I will quickly run you through the format. Uh, we will start with a poll to assess pre-debate opinions. The poll is already open. You can already start answering. This is before you have been exposed to the arguments by our uh, speakers. And uh, after that, uh, we'll close it. And each of our speakers will have eight minutes to present the arguments. We will alternate between the uh, team speaking for and against the motion. And then uh, we will open the debate to all of you. Uh, so it is an opportunity for you to make comments. You can also ask questions, but we welcome comments. And uh, if you would like to participate, please use the raise hand button that you find in the lower right of your screen. When I call upon you, uh, your video and microphone will be turned on unless you refuse to do it. So we can see and hear you. If you do not want to speak, you can also write your comment or question in the chat, but we prefer uh, to have this interaction. And uh, you will have one minute to make your point and then we will move to the next person. So please don't make it super long. And uh, of course, as in any debate, the comments have to be respectful. Um, after the audience contributions, each uh, side is uh, given five minutes uh, to make a reply and uh, summarize uh, the standpoint. And after that, we switch on the same poll, again, asking you the same questions, but we want to monitor how your opinions have changed uh, following the arguments. And then we will present the results. Um, the chat is turned off uh, for any further communications. If you have any uh, technical problems or if you want to uh, raise anything up with our technical team, uh, please just uh, write to SEDS online um, that you see in uh, the list of participants. All right, uh, enough speaking. Uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, today's motion is autogenic processes in sedimentary systems are just a part of the allogenic spectrum. And uh, I think uh, most of you have um, uh, participated in the poll already, but we will wait uh, another 30 seconds to give you the last chance to express your opinion. So please place your uh, pre-debate uh, uh, votes into the... Uh, on today's uh, motion in the poll. And it is, it is anonymous, so don't worry about that. We will not give your contact details to the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can see uh, the numbers are not changing anymore. So I, ah, still, uh, we have 41 votes out of, uh, 51 people participating. Your last chance. Okay, I think we can we can close it now. And uh, uh, Or and Valentin, can you please close the poll? Um, and uh, now uh, 
I shall uh, give the stage to our uh, first speaker. Um, so Andre, I would like to now call upon you. You have eight minutes to speak for the motion and you can share your uh, slides now if you, if, you will, if you will. Okay, thank you very much, Emilia. Can you see the screen? Not yet. Can, you can't see the screen. We cannot. Uh, there's you a can. Can no, no. Hold on. There's a slight problem here. Can you see it now? No. We tested it before it worked. Uh, have you used the uh, uh, share screen button on the bottom of your screen? Yes, this, this is what I did. Okay. Can you see something now? No, I think you're not sharing anything with us yet. Yeah. I think there must be super secret arguments. Well, I'm really sorry about this. Oh, don't, don't worry. Uh, it just builds up the tension. We start again. So I share the screen. I share the screen. Is we that better see. now? We can yes, see yes, yes. Now. yes. Still better? Yes. Is okay. it good? Okay. Good. <laughs> Eight minutes from now. Yes, sorry about this. So, uh, Chulte Keys to Bahamas, uh, tidal channels shift laterally, sediment bodies which hold shift laterally. So, these are processes that are inherent in the cis this sedimentary system. Sometimes they're repetitive, so you can call them autocyclic. However, the system is also controlled by deeper forces like plate tectonics that control subsidence or by climate changes. They can be allogenic like volcanism, episodic or allocyclic if we talk about orbital cycles. So the motion is, Emilia has said it, autogenic processes in sedimentary systems are just part of the allogenic spectrum. Autogenic, yes, of course, each sedimentary system has its own internal dynamics. Allogenic, yes, of course, also, because external controls by plate tectonics, volcanism, and astronomical forcing, they do exist. There's no doubt about it. The challenge now is to decipher which part of the sedimentary record was controlled by which process, allogenic and or, I insist on the and or, autogenic. Now, again, there's a problem here. Sorry about this. A, a mouse click might move the slide, actually. Oh, yeah. yes. Okay. So um, the problem is, how do we translate orbital forcing? This would be a typical allocyclic process, orbital forcing, into the sedimentary system. Orbital cycles control insulation, which means the energy on top of the atmosphere, which then translates into atmospheric circulation, oceanic circulations. Depends, of course, on latitude, shape of the uh, ocean and platforms, orography, and so on. And then we have the climate changes, temperature, humidity, wind, seasonality. If you have rain, then you can have a vegetation cover. If you don't have rain, you have a desert. Rainfall uh, creates input of siliciclastic and nutrients into the system. This is a shallow water carbonate platform. The organisms then, of course, react. Climate also controls water chemistry, energy, storms. And if you have upwelling, you can feed the plankton that will then produce carbonate. So these organisms, these ecosystems that produce the sediment are dependent indirectly, of course, on the orbital cycles. And you have many, many feedback processes in between. Commonly, allergenic and autogenic processes are combined. and They enhance or they att attenuate themselves. In the fluvial system, climate changes are allogenic. They control rainfall, sediment transport, vegetation cover. Autogenic, of course, we have avulsions, channel migration, and we have local vegetation changes. 
In lakes, in lacustrine systems, halogenic, again, climate changes, control rainfall, river input, evaporation, lake level, water temperature, and chemistry, and the biota. Also, the biota can be autogenic. We have lake water circulation, delta switching, lateral migration of sediment bodies, but the biota, so they can have uh, internal reactions, but also controlled by allogenic processes. What is important to see that paleo latitude, ocean continent distribution, sin sedimentary tectonics, volcanism, orography, and of course, biotic evolution through geological time are important parameters that should not be forgotten. Uh, mouse click, hold on. Yes, in shallow marine systems, again, allogenic climate changes, sea level, we have seen this before, and autogenic, we have lateral migration of sediment bodies creating facies mosaics. Sam will talk about this, I'm certain. And the biota again will depend locally on uh, local factors. Deep marine systems, climate changes again, control oceanic currents and circulation, dirigence runoff, depth of the compensation uh, zones, uh, aragonite, calcite compensation depths, oxygen minimum zones, and the biota again. And orbitally, that's important, orbitally induced sea level changes control export of sediment from the platform into the basin. Autogenic lateral migration, switching of fans, mounds that build up, and again, the biota. And of course, the external factors. Now, an example. Uh, this split uh, system, complex split system in Western Australia is pushed by coastal currents. And you can see it starts closing off a lagoon, which will cause dramatic ecological changes that will be totally different from those in the open ocean. Allogenic, of course, is the sea level rise anthropogenically induced today that will flood the system unless the sediment accumulation can keep up. An example from the variation in the uh, French Jura Mountains, peritidal carbonates are stacked. Bundles of three to five beds, you can see it here, can be recognized as well as uh, a long scale, a large scale thinning up trend that is then followed by a large scale thickening trend. We need chronostratigraphic time control. And the hierarchy, of course, they suggest then that one bed formed in June with a 20 kilo year precession cycle, orbital cycle, allogenic, allocyclic, and the bundle in June with the 100 kilo year short eccentricity cycle. And the large scale trend that actually leads to the formation of a third order sequence boundary can be attributed to the 405 kilo year long eccentricity cycle. The fit is not perfect, unfortunately, because we have hiatuses in these shallow water systems. A deeper water hemipelagic system, these limestone mull alternations in the Vaconchian Basin in France, Again, we need chronostratigraphic time control based on ammonites. Uh, we have a hierarchical stacking again. You see a bundle of five beards, and again, 20,000 years, five times would be 100,000 years, a short eccentricity cycle. How did the system function? Orbitally induced oceanic changes controlled the nutrient availability and thus the carbonate productivity by the plankton. And we had rainfall that put in that washed in the clays from the hinterland to form the marls. And we had sea level changes that controlled the uh, uh, carbonate mud export from the platform into the basin. Genic versus cyclic, I'd like to differentiate this. So autogenic would be, could be episodic. It just means it is generated within the system and cyclic, it is repetitive. Now, the Milankovitch, the orbital allocytes are quasi-periodic and they occurred throughout Earth history. So they have been there ever since the Earth turned around the sun. And their periodicities can be calculated by our friends, the astrophysicists. Thus, these are good pacemakers for allogenic processes. Autogenic processes may be repetitive, but I don't think they can reproduce the hierarchy of orbital cyclicity. And again, of course, we need numerical time control to check on this. So I come to the conclusion, autogenic and allogenic processes, they live happily together and they contribute to the beauty, to the diversity of the sedimentary systems. Allocyclic processes, mainly induced by astronomical forcing through climate are important, I've tried to show this. Autocyclic processes may occur within orbitally controlled allocycles. And the challenge of course is deciphering the contribution of each type of process, both work together. And this requires detailed analysis of the sedimentary system and numerical time control. 
Thank you very much. This was my point. Thank you very much, Andre, for, for this uh, excellent summary. And now I uh, call upon Sam Perkis to speak against the motion. All right, then I will, uh, I will now share my screen and we will, if you could let me know that you see it. Not yet. I, not yet. No, 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 not yet. I haven't got there yet. How about now? Perfect. All right, then. Well, that, I think that was an excellent introduction from Andre. And uh, in many ways, I agree with him. But I want to disentangle and move forward uh, from what he said. And I will be speaking against the motion. And to begin with, I would like to think a little bit about what we mean by autogenic, in case any in the audience are not familiar. And a lot of this work actually comes out of this SCPM special publication that I did with David Budd and Liz Hijek uh, so many years ago now. So as Andre explained, traditionally many patterns in Earth systems have been explained by allergenic factors. They are external to the system. Sea level and Milankovitch orbital cycles would be the classic, of course. Autogenic, as Andre actually well described, simply describes the condition where a bias system is con controlled by a process arising from within itself. And there's an important distinction here to make that some autogenic process can spontaneously produce regular patterns and perhaps even cycles, what we call auto cycles, but it's not a necessary part of the autogenic definition. There's no reason to assume that an autogenic process will always be autocyclic or will always be pattern forming. However, in saying that, some autogenic mechanisms do generate regular spatial patterns by a process that we call spatial self-organization. And often this comes from the biology on the planet. Uh, the patterns are resultant from close interactions between organisms or between organisms and their physical and or their chemical environment. And we have wonderful examples of regular spatial patterns in terrestrial and marine systems, and we'll look at a few in a second. Abiotic systems also can show autogenic processes. Spatial self-organization has been evoked to explain geochemical self-patterning observed in rocks, resultant from positive feedbacks, as has uh, David Budd's work would be a good example of that and to deliver cast landscapes, which also uh, rely on positive feedbacks between precipitation and concentration and focusing of erosion. And given that these behaviors have been recognized in modern depositional systems, I think it's reasonable to assume that it characterized ancient Earth as well, and that spatially self-organized patterns will be widely preserved in the rock record. To drill just a touch further into this process of self-organization, this is really a universal characteristic of any complex system, of which the Earth, of course, is a great example, in that the whole is greater and or uh, significantly different from the linear sum of its parts. And this collected outcome is what we call emergent behavior, where the constituents of a system agglomerate themselves to form the emergent whole, and large-scale ordered spatial patterns can emerge from small scale interactions. And as I say, often to do with the biology of the system. Alan Turing, way back in the 50s, he recognized these facts in his pioneering work. And he identified that coupled feedback loops are very often behind uh, spatial self-organization and emergent patterning. Typically, you have a positive and a negative feedback uh, offset in their spatial scales. And models based on Alan Turing's pioneering work, as I show here in the center, produce these emergent patterns from very simple ingredients, along with their feedback loops. And they've been used to explain some of the classic emergent patterns uh, observed in terrestrial systems, such as the spots and tiger bands that we get uh, developing for vegetation in arid regions. Here, the short distance positive feedback is that the ve vegetation itself amplifies the um, infiltration of water into the sediment, therefore allowing the vegetation to grow more vigorously. But between the patches, we have a long 
uh, wavelength negative feedback where the crust which forms on the surface of these arid landscapes prevents infiltration and therefore those feedbacks then conspire to deliver regular patterning. Of course that is not a good example for a geologist but it is the classic explanation of Alan Turing's work back in the 50s. More uh, relevant to the debate are examples of self-emergent patterning in carbonate depositional systems. And here I show the interior of a coral reef in uh, Alacran off of the Yucatan Peninsula in the Gulf of Mexico. And we see these beautiful reticular fractal patterns, which are resulting from the interaction of the coral organism with itself and its self-inhibiting of the metabolism as this lagoon becomes restricted, much as Andre showed from the example of in Shark Bay in Australia. And there we have a space filling pattern and the corals start to self-organize and produce this emergent uh, image. Another example now uh, related to reefs, so I'm gonna go to the Great Barrier Reef and work by Marty McNeil and Jody Webster. We're not looking at the corals themselves, we're looking further outboard on the Great Barrier Reef. So this huge ecosystem, which is uh, only recently been imaged with multi-beam and built by Halameda, a calcareous algae. It's several times larger than the reef themselves of the Great Barrier Reef. And we see these beautiful annulate reticular patterns in the Halameda mounds, which are being generated by the interaction of that organism with itself and the hydrodynamics and the bathymetry on the continental shelf here off of the Great Barrier Reef. Another example, and also brought by Andre, where we have the tongue of the ocean, uh, Uid Sanchol, the greatest high energy oolitic deposit on earth. And we have these beautiful regular patterns starting to emerge through the interaction of tidal forcing and the bathymetry of the shelf. If this system is disturbed by hurricanes, as it often is, it will quickly reform because this is a, this is a type of emergent patterning within just a few days of the disturbance. And similarly here in Florida Bay, we see the beautiful reticular patterns of the mud banks, which have been studied back since the 50s, resulting of an interaction between wind-driven currents in this case and the bathymetry of the shelf. So the rock record, I show two seismic slices there from upper Paleozoic platforms of the Barents Sea. This is work with uh, Julio Cassini and Dave Hunt and Almo Carpo. I did some years ago. And here we see a phyloid algal system at the same scale as Florida Bay here, building beautiful reticular patterns, presumably because of the interaction of the metabolism of that organism with its surroundings. And finally, a just published example I found by, by Daniel Ugrimu here, who's looking at upper Jurassic uh, sponge bioherms. And we see these beautiful circular annulate patterns again, uh, preserved in the rock records and a similar explanation of self-organization. So as the great Bob Ginsburg would have said, why do we care about such matters? Why do we care about spatial self-organization? Well, it all uh, uh, plays into how strata are preserved in the rock record. In the upper pane here, I give a textbook example where we have facies belts which are perfectly delineated by water depth. It's a textbook example, it's not realistic, but under such a situation, the allergenic forcing of sea level moving up and down will then lead to predictable cycles being deposited that we can then read in the rock record and reconstruct what was sea level was doing and when. Unfortunately, the more common case is the lower example here where we get a facies mosaic as has been uh, emphasized by Paul Wright and Peter Burgess and their pioneering work on the topic where we have interactions and feedbacks between the organisms and, um, and their environment where we get a complex facies mosaic. These uh, deposits are now not delineated by water depth and they can self-evolve under their own internal forcings to produce complex stratigraphies. They might be cyclic and they might not. So we've seen that self-organization can obscure or create cyclicity. It actually delivers surprising mathematical predictability and it can have drastic ecological 
at tipping points and consequences. One of the, uh, the emergent properties of self-organization is what we call self-organized criticality, where you can have sudden and dramatic shifts in natural systems in response to subtle environmental forcings. And the danger here that you would wrongly attribute those changes in sedimentation to an allergenic forcing, where in fact they are entirely coming from interactions within the system itself. So with that, um, I will... Sorry. We have to take uh, the floor away from you. Well, I just said with that, I just finished. All right, perfect. <laughs> I, uh, I cannot give uh, any site uh, um, more time. So we have to be very strict about this. Well, it was, it was perfect timing and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, eloquent um, argument. And uh, uh, I now call upon David uh, uh, to second uh, for the motion. Uh, thank you. Um, so in this picture, you're looking at a Givation uh, carbonate platform, so Middle Devonian. And the picture that just popped up um, shows a paleosol level within that section, which is called the Latour section in southern Belgium, by the way. Another picture where you see nice branchings from a top roids, but the dashed line uh, indicates an erosional surface. So it is quite obvious that th in this sedimentary archive, there is time missing. We have a paleosol, we have erosion, and therefore it doesn't look like the perfect spot to go and look for allogenic cycles, Milankovitch cycles, or nor to do cyclostatigraphy. Nevertheless, that is exactly what I did uh, during my PhD a couple of years ago on Devonian cyclostatigraphy. And in the next seven and a half minutes or so, I will explain the, I will explain the techniques that a cyclostatigrapher can use to construct a meaningful cyclostatigraphy, an allogenic cycle-based interpretation on a carbonate platform setting like the one you're looking at right now. So the cyclostatigraphy I uh, constructed for the Latour section is based on the wavelet analysis that you see here, uh, which is in turn based on the magnetic susceptibility signal from the section. And the magnetic susceptibility signal is the red signal, the red series you see here. And so in this series, we interpreted two main rhythmical components. A first component with a stratigraphic thickness of 23, uh, between 23 and 30 meters. So let's say about 25 meters. And this rhythmical component of 25 meters was interpreted as the imprint of the 400,000 year eccentricity cycle. And these, they are indicated by the green filter here and by the white, yellow alternating bands. A second rhythmical component had a stratigraphic thickness of eight meters. And these are the blue cycles that you see um, over here, so 100,000 year eccentricity. And now I want you to zoom in on these two cycles here. So in this 400,000 year bundle, we have one, two, three, 100,000 year eccentricity cycles. And the same in the, in the, the cycle here at the base of the Fromland formation, one, two, three, um, 100,000 year eccentricity cycles in a 400,000 year bundle. And so it is quite obvious that in these two cycles, which you are looking at here on the pictures, uh, on, on the picture here, there is about 25% of time missing. My point is that most of the time will be missing in a handful of hiatuses, just a few hiatuses where several ten thousands of years is missing. And in such a case, what happens to your time series analysis, to your spectral, as a spectral analysis, is that your frequency ratios, they are squeezed together in the depth domain. And you can nicely see that in the spectral analyses that you see here. So the top panel shows the spectral plot of magnetic susceptibility, the lower one, spectral analyses of the microfacies. We already talked about the 25 meter cycle interpreted as the imprint of 400,000 year eccentricity, the eight meter cycle interpreted as the uh, imprint of 100,000 year eccentricity. And here in the spectra, you see oh, in the spectrum, you also see a three meter cycle, which we uh, connect to obliquity and a one and a half meter cycle, which we connect to 18,000 year precession. So if we now start looking at how many precession cycles do fit in into a 400,000 year cycle in the depth domain, we see that we only fit in 16.6 one and a half meter tick cycles into a 25 meter bundle. That is significantly less than what one would expect from astronomical theory, because astronomical theory, theory, theory teaches us 
that we expect 22 and a half, 18,000 year precession cycles to fit in to a 400,000 year bundle. So what's happening? Because we are removing time in um, a hiatus that can last several 10,000 years, it's quite likely that part of the lithological cycle that represents the imprint of the 405,000 year eccentricity cycle, so the big puppet here, the big matrushka, a part of that cycle is missing. But a significant part of the cycle is preserved, about 75% in the Latour case, and it can be used as a geological metronome well suited to make a cyclostatigraphic time calibration to count 405,000 year cycles. Precession cycles, on the other hand, there it is quite likely that we're missing multiple consecutive cycles within our hiatus, but the precession cycles that are preserved, the one and a half meter cycles that are preserved, they are likely to be complete and they thus provide our best shot at reconstructing sedimentation rates. And so if we take one and a half meters deposited in 18,000 years, back of the envelope calculation, we have a sedimentation rate of about 8.3 centimeters per thousand years. And that is a nice fit with the results of uh, Min Song Lee. So what Min Song Lee did in 2018 he uh, developed this, his ECOCO uh, method, which stands for Evolutive Correlation Coefficient Method. And he demonstrated the power of that method by using the Latour depth series or the Latour magnetic susceptibility series as a case study. And what you see here in this heat map are the most likely sedimentation rates that Min Song reconstructed for the Latour section. And you see they are between six and 12 centimeters per thousand years with the highest sedimentation rates when we have a facies closest to the reef, closest to the, to the carbonate or where the carbonate production is the highest. So that all makes sense and fits very nicely with our back of the envelope calculation in the previous slide. Here, the black line is the sedimentation rate that you would calculate when you use the 400,000 year cycle. So the cycles that are affected by these big hiatuses, and it is clear that they underestimate the clear, the, the true sedimentation rates, but they are useful for cyclostratigraphic um, analysis or cycle counting. And so the point I want to make here is, yes, in a shallow water environment, autogenic and local and regional processes that are completely independent of orbital forcing, they may, may create rhythmical facious patterns on orbital time scales. However, a cyclostratigrapher is able to disentangle that complex stacking pattern that is left behind by astronomical forcing and which cannot be reproduced by autogenic cycles. So that was the first point I uh, wanted to make in this uh, debate. The second point I wanted to make is that autocyclic processes do not only play a role in shallow water environments, but they also characterize the behavior of ice caps and oceans as well. I want to kick off this point by starting with the famous Imbri and Imbri model published in 1980, where in which Imbri and Imbri were dealing with the 100,000 year problem. So the 100,000 year problem is that the glacial interglacial cycles of the Pleistocene, they have a very strong 100,000 year rhythm. However, if you take a spectral analysis of any insulation curve on Earth, there is no 100,000 year peak. By building a highly nonlinear model, so emphasizing nonlinear processes in the Earth system, they were able to get a model output that was quite similar to the glacial interglacial cycle. And so the Imbri and Imbri paper with a nonlinear mechanism idea was fundamental in the revival of the Milankovitch theory in the 1980s. In 1995, the Milankovitch theory got a little bit criticized by a group of people who claimed that. The 100,000 year glacial cycles had nothing to do with Milankovitch and everything, everything to do with the accretion of extraterrestrial dust and meteorites. But luckily in 1999, Wolfgang Berger published his very important paper on 100,000 year ice age cycles based by Milankovitch, but characterized by nonlinear responses to the forcing, strongly lagged feedback mechanisms and internal oscillators internal oscillators within the Earth system. And so since then, the paleoclimatological community is slowly disentangling all the mechanisms that are um, at play here, explaining the 100,000 year glacial interglacial cycles. And this example here, these authors advocate sea ice as a crucial part 
of the system with uh, its albedo and its insulating effects, creating some kind of uh, natural resonance frequency of about 100,000 kiloyears. And so since the year 2000, uh, many papers have been published. I pick out two here, uh, one by them. I'm really sorry. Can you uh, summarize this uh, yeah. slide in just one sentence? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll wrap it up here. Um, Denton et al. They um, claim that uh, the Southern Ocean is uh, is a, a is a very nonlinear mechanism uh, pushing CO two in the atmosphere and therefore creating these very fast deglaciations. Abe Uchi et al. They are claiming that um, isostatic downwarping is an autocyclic process that um, can create rapid deglaciations and therefore is an autocyclic process that can do that. But a paper in 2010 by Lisiecki and Remo, they said they came to the conclusion that the glacial interglacial cycles, they are, um, they are face locked with eccentricity. So, no matter, so it is uncontested that um, the internal feedbacks of the climate system are in part autocyclic. However, they're still face locked by eccentricity. Their timing is determined by um, astronomical forcing, so by allogenic processes. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an awful part of my uh, job to, uh, to make but sure important. That you stick to the time. <laughs> um, I now call upon Anthony uh, to second for the opposition. Uh, please try to stick to the time. Excellent. Um, right, let's go. Uh, so hi everyone, we've heard a lot of good points so far, and lots of great examples of both autogenic and allogenic processes in sedimentary systems. But as the final speaker in this part of the debate, I want to really consolidate what the differences between these processes are, refresh what the motion is actually really saying, um, and then provide some additional points of evidence to demonstrate that not all autogenic processes can be considered to be on the allogenic spectrum. So the statement autogenic processes in sedimentary systems are just part of the allogenic spectrum can be put in simpler terms, essentially saying that all processes in sedimentary systems can be viewed in a way that they seem to be controlled by something outside of the system. We've already seen some great examples from Sam, how on the big picture this isn't was the case, but remember, whilst we are arguing against the motion, we're not denying the importance of allergenic processes in all these systems. What we are saying, though, is that not every single autogenic process can be considered a part of an allergenic spectrum. Some of these processes are purely autogenic. So I'm going to follow this up from two angles in particular. I'm going to look briefly at fluvial systems before diving into why bioturbation really provides the last nail in the coffin of this motion. So in a recent paper by uh, uh, Lys Heidek and Straub from I think 2017, they looked at experimental sets from different types of fluvial system, which reveal how sedimentation rates uh, differ even in the absence of changing allergenic forcings. So these graphs show normalized sedimentation rates from synthetic stratigraphy at the marked points in two different fluvial systems. And the external forcing conditions or the allergenic processes were all kept constant in these experiments, so including the feed rate of water, the rate of base level rise. Therefore, any of this variation in sedimentation rate is purely due to autogenic processes. As a result, the, uh, the, as the processes controlling the sedimentation are purely within the system, they can't really be placed on an allergenic spectrum. They just don't fit in with a definition of what allergenic is. In the absence of anything allergenic, it's even clearer when we look at the smallest scales and look at sediment reworking due to bioturbation. So the example shown here is from a Paleozoic tidal flat from the Tumbleguda sandstone in Western Australia. And looking at this bed here, uh, we can see that it's been totally reworked by animals following the initial deposition of the sediment. Um, and after that reworking, nothing else has happened to it, so we can still discern these kind of the individual burrows in there. Whilst the initial deposition of the sediment could have been controlled by a mix of allergenic and autogenic processes, the process which produced these structures is driven entirely by factors within the system. As such, the, the bioturbation itself, the formation of these burrows, the reworking of this sediment is purely an autogenic process and is not 
placed and cannot be placed on an allergenic spectrum. This slide uh, is here to illustrate perturbation in action. It shows a still from a video uh, by Micropolitan Museum called Worms at Work. And again, it's basically to show how the reworking of sediment occurs within a, within a system. Um, as you can see, sediment is being moved around and reworked by, by these worms, which are part of this sedimentary system. And no external forcings are controlling the formation of these, of these structures, these burrows. Again, because of this, it would be very difficult to place this reworking of sediment on an allergenic spectrum, as it's all being moved about by factors contained neatly within this system. In fact, bioturbation on a larger scale can be shown to be autogenic, um, and the style of sediment reworking that occurs uh, not controlled by allergenic factors. So the ignofasci paradigm neatly illustrates this. So essentially, for those that aren't familiar with trace fossils or ignofascies in general, the ignofascies paradigm is a set of trace fossil associations which are known to occur in like, specific sedimentary environments. And this has been proven throughout geological time from the point where the trace making animals first evolved and were able to start producing these types of burrows. But what occur happens is that in a given sedimentary environment, no matter where you are in the world or when you are in geological time, you still see sediment being reworked in the same ways by animals. So if you're in the deep sea in the abyssal zone, you get traces like this starting to form. You get the Nereites ignofasces wherever you are, whenever you are. If you're slightly shallower, you get things like Zuvikos forming. Um, again, essentially certain suites of trace fossils will occur no matter what the uh, allergenic forcings happen to be. And these ignofasces are remarkably robust. Um, in fact, they're often used to interpret depositional settings, even when there aren't any other, or when there is a lack of other signatures that we can use. But it means that whether you're looking at high latitudes in the Carboniferous or moderate latitudes in the Jurassic or low latitudes of the present day, you would still expect to see the same types of burrows or sediment being reworked in the same ways in the same sedimentary environments. So this means that no matter where you are, whatever the earth is doing in relation to the sun, uh, no matter how the climate is changing, the given sedimentary environment, you're going to see sediment being reworked in the same ways. So that's controlled again by these autogenic processes. The sediment reworking by bioturbating organisms is entirely controlled by autogenic factors. And allergenic factors are essentially unimportant as to how the sediment is being reworked. So to wrap up, and I know I'm a little bit early, I think that the evidence we presented here conclusively shows that not all autogenic processes can be placed onto an allergenic spectrum. So there are many examples of processes that can be considered to be purely autogenic. And yeah, I, I think that for that reason, we can argue that the motion should not carry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, that was really fast. Um, and uh, just a quick recap. Uh, um, while uh, the audience can uh, ask uh, questions or make comments, uh, participate in the debate, um, our speakers have uh, time to coordinate uh, for the final words, uh, which they will be given at the end. Uh, each team will have five minutes to uh, present the uh, remarks, uh, re make a rebuttal to the arguments of the opposition. While they have this time, the, the time belongs to you, the audience. So I now open the debate to the floor. If anyone would like to speak, then please use the raise hand button. When I ask you uh, to turn on your video and microphone, uh, you can start. Um, and you, will, you have one minute, please stick to the time or I will have to try to cut. Uh, and uh, please keep your comments respectful to the participants and um, questions will be answered at the end in the final five minutes uh, for each team, okay? I see we have the first question by Niklas Hohmann. Uh, so please free to unmute yourself and uh, turn on your camera if you want. And uh, we're looking forward to your question. 
We cannot hear you though. Uh, we, we could always type it into the chat. Yeah, well, let's give it a final try uh, with the voice. We can't hear you. Okay, how about you type your uh, question into the chat box and uh, I will read it uh, for the audience. But if anybody else has comments, you can start raising your hands and uh, uh, we will uh, give the floor to you. Uh, or Bialik, you can un unmute yourself. Okay, so firstly, great uh, arguments from everybody. But uh, to, to me, it seems like uh, one of the main focus that we have that, that's for the autogenic side is the element of self-organization as the principal uh, with, with interacting uh, feedbacks but all of these feedbacks at the end of the day do have an internal uh, and an external forcing response so yes bioturbation do self-replicate in the guild level but at the same time we do see that the guilds will shift as we move along between phases belts when we, we, we do go from the Cruziana phases to, to the Zufaika because uh, phases if we have changes in sea level if we have changes in accumulation rate so there so it's not self-evident that self-organization is, is inherently making these front it, isolates these processes from the allogenic uh, from the allogenic forcing that applies to these systems okay so just uh, thank you very much or just a reminder that uh, questions can be answered in the final uh, uh, comments by the uh, speakers um, so we also welcome uh, uh, comments and opinions uh, Niklas do you want to try again Yeah, still, still not working. I'm really sorry about this, but I, I'm afraid this might be something on your side. Please don't get discouraged by this. If anybody has any comments, uh, please raise your hands. You have only uh, six minutes left for um, making a case. Yeah, um, I think Stephen, uh, hidden behind Seds Online, uh, wants to say something. Please uh, unmute yourself. Or was it uh, a glitch? Elias, Elias, please, uh, please uh, unmute, unmute yourself. So great, great arguments on both sides i my question goes to both sides uh, would you would you see a difference in the ice ice house world and in the greenhouse greenhouse world's world if you check the different cases on in, in cyclicity thank you very much alias Thank you, thank you very much, Elias. You, you just gave a riddle to our speakers. Uh, we also have the um, question from Nikas. For the self-organization, we usually only observe the patterns generated by the processes. I wonder how do we test for self-organization without having a hypothesis on the generating process? Well, that's a tricky one. Um, thank you, Nikas. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Please don't be shy. We have overcome our shyness, so you can do that too. Uh, 
uh, we have, um, I will first uh, call upon Jim. Uh, Jim, please unmute yourself. I am unmuted, I think. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, so a uh, yeah, question to both uh, parties. Um, and that is, does this actually depend upon our frame of reference? So it seems to me that um, if you have, you can have self-organization or autogenic processes in a frame of reference of space, but once you start putting into frame of reference of time, they are by definition going to be taking place in the context of allergenic changes because allergenic features change through time, whether or not they are directly affecting the, uh, uh, the cell organization processes at a particular point in time, if that made sense. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, uh, we still have uh, three minutes for uh, questions. Um, and we have uh, a question from Daniel Fragoso here. I don't know if this is a glitch or Guillaume actually uh, wants to make a comment. Okay. Um, we have a question from Daniel Fagoso. Uh, actually, a comment. Uh, the theme is extremely timely and necessary. It was possible to remember Laplace Timon. We can extract some insights from an epistemological point of view. I admit to being in favor of the motion. An argument in this regard. I think it is the preservation effect promoted by allogenic processes. In this sense, even if we consider the sedimentary organization produced by autogenic processes, preservation is in indispensable for something to be observed in the geological record. In other words, even though autogenic processes generate sedimentary deposits as seen in modern environments, the geological record will always be vertically limited by allogenic preservation. Um, and uh, we also have a, a uh, question from Fiona, who also has no audio that works. Um, she follows on Jim's question, what about forcing through time that are not regular? Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to uh, add to this pile of questions, uh, but since uh, we, we have no hands raised, uh, while listening to Anthony's um, uh, arguments, I was really curious if there is any uh, attempt to study the occurrence and the preservation of bioturbation in relationship to uh, melan coverage cyclicity. Because uh, I, I imagine that um, it would be also responding to the physical processes generated uh, or transmitted uh, through the melan coverage cyclicity. So that would be quite interesting if this is really completely decoupled. Um, your last chance to make comments. Okay, uh, in that case, um, thank you everybody for participating. And um, I will now call upon Andre, who has five minutes to present uh, the rebuttal uh, for the proposition uh, and address uh, the comments and questions uh, and arguments from the other side. Andre, um, the stage is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. You will give me the timing, please. I might get carried away. Well, actually, I'm, I'm not sure we're talking about debate here. I think all the talks, the four talks, have been perfectly complementary. So what I see, I, actually, I would, I would change the wording of the motion. It, it, should, it should not say, as, as Anthony said, it's not just a part, the autogenic is not just a part of the allogenic, it's an important part. It's not just a part, it's a very important part. And if you look at today's systems as, as Sam showed us and um, the bioturbation uh, case of, of Anthony, I mean, these are things that happen today, but it happened at a certain time, a long time ago. Uh, and I think where it becomes complementary. So these are the systems that work and they live and the organisms they work and they biturbate and they grow and they produce sediment or they, and the, the, the rivers uh, bring in uh, sediment into the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. So this is beautiful. 
And this is the reality. And we have today's proxies. We can go and look and measure and study these, these uh, sedimentary and ecological processes. Uh, where I see the difference between the two, the for motion and against motion, is the time. So uh, what David showed us is stratigraphy, cyclostratigraphy. And this is a tool to get a hold on the timing. So if we can say, OK, for this two meters of sediment, we had 20,000 years, because we can demonstrate it was controlled by the precession cycle through all these feedbacks and so on. But somehow, we can say for these 20 or 20 centimeters, one meter, two meters of sediment package, uh, we have a time control. And now within this sediment package, we can start looking at autogenic processes, which of course occurred. We have self-organization, we have uh, uh, evolution, we have shifting things, we have uh, organisms that react. But the organisms and also the self-organization of reefs if you rise sea level, for example, through an allogenic process, Milankovitch cycle, for of course, the self-organization will have to adapt automatically. So the reef can be drowned because of ecological processes, because sea level was, rise was, was too fast, because we have ocean acidification. Uh, so I think really it is within the autogenics are within the uh, allogenics. So for me, there's no problem. There's no need, need for debate. We're perfectly, we perfectly agree on this. It's just how we, how we put the focus, how we put the importance. I think depending on where we start working, if we work today on the Bahamas or in Australia, uh, we have a different view. And as if we work in the Devonian or in the Jurassic Cretacean, we look at the sediment record at the stratigraphy and we try to explain the stacking pattern. I think these are two different aspects that are, again, complementary. What I also said in my talk is that allogenic and autogenic may, might actually hide or attenuate themselves, or uh, I mean, the, the autogenic might be hidden between the allogenic or the other way around. So the autogenic can be so important that the allogenic signal, like for example, uh, small climate changes uh, are not recorded because the biturbation has messed up everything. So we have this interaction that's very interesting. Now, uh, just uh, to Elias' uh, comment, uh, greenhouse world, uh, ice house world, I think there's a big difference uh, because the, the ice house world is much more complex. We have more interactions. We had the uh, we had pseudo cyclical processes like the Dansker Oeschger events, for example. Uh, and then we come to the sub Milankovitch problem. Uh, we do see in cyclostratigraphy cyclicities that are not linked to the classical orbital cycles. So these are the sub Milankovitch cycles, and nobody really knows how to explain these. So in ice house worlds, I think the feedbacks are so complex uh, that we find a solution, like Dansker Oeschger events, like uh, uh, Enzo, for example, Enzo Southern Isolation, things like this. So there's a, a, a lower. Uh, or higher, faster cyclicity. And in greenhouse worlds, things were smoother. We had the big carbonate platforms that could happily uh, prograde and aggregate. We had no big sea level drops, dramatic sea level drops. So the system was totally different. Uh, and again, it would be interesting to, to do case studies comparing the two, the two things. And to Jim Hendry's comment about the timing, this is exactly what, what, uh, what I want to express that uh, if we come from the stratigraphy side, we want to know how much time is in a certain sediment package. If we come from the uh, actualistic side, self-organization side, then we actually look at the, the facies, the facies uh, mosaics. We look at the organisms that bioturbated the system. Andre, I need to. Uh, I have to stop. I know. I know. I could go right? on and on for another two hours, but I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we will now uh, move to the opposing team. Um, Sam, uh, you have five minutes to, uh, ar to make a final argument. All right, then. Well, thank you very much. Well, I, I, I hate to say it, but I do agree with Andre, even though he's the opposition, that I feel that a lot of what has been said is actually complementary. Certainly, uh, we, Anthony and myself, are not arguing that autogenic processes obscure those formed by allergenic mechanisms. Instead, we're arguing that complex interactions result 
as those two uh, forcings come together. And the fact that Milankovic can be recognized in the rock record is certainly not an argument for the motion. It, it should absolutely be autogenic processes, as I say, do not always exert dominant sway. Indeed, I would argue that the feedbacks necessary from autogenic process to develop might be allergenic or partially so. And so the two cannot be separated so easily. And just to come back to make it absolutely clear, all autogenic processes are not autocyclic. In fact, much of the results of autogenesis might be statistically indistinguishable from random. And that's a very important distinction. There was a comment about time. And I would think that it would, could be argued that at least the evolution of the early Earth was primarily controlled by allogenic processes, but swiftly autogenic start to take over, such as the oxygenation of the atmosphere and the uh, caused by something within the system, the evolving of the planet's biota, which then has huge ramifications for the entire Earth system. In fact, I'd go as far to say that it's the autogenic factors which differentiate our planet from those which are else which are in the solar system. It's the autogenic processes which give rise to life and then take over. In, there was a question as well about the lack of a hypothesis uh, for autogenics. I would, I would rebut that by saying that recent work has revealed abundant examples in the modern and in the ancient world where spatial self-organization can be uh, recognized in stratal deposition. And in many cases, those examples accompanied by a firm understanding of the mechanisms which generate the emergent patterns. So with that, I will finish. I'm going to pass it to Anthony in case he has some, any final words in our five minutes. But I believe the case is made and the motion should not carry. Anthony. I think that Sam has wrapped up our case very neatly. And I'd like to say on the point of timescales again, as Orr suggested, that when you, even if you're looking at trace fossils occurring in a set environment, what you get will change through time due to allergenic forcings on the system. We're not denying that. However, once you could say that the, how a system changes through time may be a result of allergenic forcings, the processes occurring within the system and those that are resulting in the sedimentation at any given moment can be considered autogenic. And these are not on an allergenic spectrum. I think as, as both sides have suggested, We'd, we have a lot in common. I think we agree on most points, um, but I still strongly believe that the motion should not carry. All right, uh, you are in the uh, faster team in that you finished uh, before time. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, for this summary. And uh, we will now open an anonymous poll to um, probe your uh, opinions um, after you have heard the arguments. Uh, we are very curious to know whether your opinions have uh, changed. All right, I think uh, the opinions are stabilizing. Okay, we will, uh, I suggest that we close the poll in uh, the next 15 seconds. So you have the final moment to, to participate. All right, uh, or can you please uh, close the poll? Um, so while our team uh, adds up the results, uh, I will make a few announcements uh, in the meantime. Uh, first of all, uh, next week we are back to our regular sets online seminars. 
And uh, the speaker next week will be Maurice Stucker from the University of Bristol, speaking about viruses in carbonate precipitation, the new frontier in air sciences. And uh, another announcement that I have for you, uh, that uh, the North American season line coffee breaks uh, have been moved from Thursdays to Fridays, effective today. And if you are curious about the details, uh, you can consult the sets online web page or find the details on Twitter. Um, all right, and uh, uh, I will, um, or and Va Valentin, uh, please let me know as soon as you have the results of the poll. Okay, um, in that case, or I think you can share your screen. Uh, could you please show us the results? Yeah, I'm uh, putting it up. I'm pulling it up. Drum roll. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think my computer just crashed. Right? So essentially, we had a very, very small change. We had, with uh, 39 percent of the people in the in, the, in attendance agreeing with the debate, both before and after, where we had most of the change was in the number of people at abstaining. So in the pre-debate, we had 29% abstaining, and after that, we have only 25% only abstaining, and more people now disagree with the debate, with the motion. And I hope you were able to see uh, that because my screen has been flickering like crazy when I try to share it. Thank you very much, Or. And uh, I would normally say that uh, the motion that autogenic processes in sedimentary systems are just part of the allogenic spectrum is carried. I hesitate to say it uh, so uh, firmly because we have seen that uh, opinions are very divided. Um, so I think. Uh, I will, I will leave you with this uh, and the comments that um, uh, Andre and Sam and Anthony and David have made on uh, the complexity of this question. And I would like to wrap up, but first of all, thanking our speakers and all you who participated in the debate. Um, it's great to have you here. Um, we are curious to know what this high abstention means. So uh, please, uh, Get back to us with feedback. You can write in the uh, in the chat to uh, set online. Uh, you can discuss on Twitter. Um, we would like to thank the International Association of Sedimentologists for sponsoring the set online activities. Um, and I would like to thank uh, the set online team and uh, everybody who participates and helps. So Valentin behind the stairs, uh, Stephen who was rushing on the highway to join us and Chelsea and uh, Ross and everybody uh, in our big team who made this meeting possible. Uh, we shall be bringing you future sets online uh, great debates. Uh, they are being planned, but if you have any ideas, uh, any burning questions that uh, you would like uh, to see debated, and if you would like to participate as a speaker to bring uh, your topic to the forefront of everybody's attention, please uh, contact us. And um, I, we are really looking forward to seeing you at the next uh, SEDS Online webinar and in the next debate.